Welcome to County Fair on Waycross Community Media. We are in downtown Cincinnati today so that we can talk to Hamilton County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Thank you so much for allowing us to come down here. One of the things I want to ask you, and um, I bring this up almost any time I have someone that's part of county government, because um, we know what, roughly, what our city government does, what our uh, village government does, and we know roughly what our state government does. But I don't know that we always know what kind of services that Hamilton County is responsible for. So can you let help us know what kind of things we should we should come to mind when we're talking about county government? Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason that people don't know what county government does is because so many times during your daily life you don't interact with county government. That's because uh, you haven't been in jail, which we run the jail. You haven't been in front of a judge because you haven't been to the courthouse. And you know some of what we do too are protect kids in this community. And you may not know a kid that has been removed from their home because of unsafe conditions. And so the county government does all of those things. Those are the mandated services that we must provide by way of the um, Ohio Revised Code. And so a um, couple things about that. One is, yes, we have to have a jail. But how do we provide the service of having a justice center in this community? I know you've talked to Trina Jackson with the Office of Recovery. So it is a way to approach housing people that are incarcerated, uh, have, making sure they serve their time, but having an office of reentry as they leave that facility to make sure they've got some kind of support system so they don't reoffend and come back into the facility. So we run a jail. But the way we run the jail, I think, is important to note. Um, one other thing um, that we're doing is retrofitting one of the floors of the jail to accommodate 90 treatment beds. Um, as I'm sure your listeners know, we have a heroin epidemic in the county, and the jail is overcrowded. A lot of the folks there uh, suffer from either issues uh, related to addiction or mental health. And so uh, we are creating these treatment beds, 90 of them, to provide more um, appropriate treatment for the people that are in the facility, but also because we've got a jail overcrowding problem. And so the state of Ohio gave us $2.5 million through the state capital budget, and we have used those dollars, and I think it's going to open up beginning of next year. Um, but again, providing a jail but also providing um, important uh, and strategic treatment to the folks in the jail to make sure they get the kind of support they need when they leave. So it sounds initially like a short list when you think children's services jail, but really there's a lot connected to that. There's um, how can we provide jail services being aware of okay, addiction is related to this, and the ability for someone to re-enter society after jail mm -hmm. is, so what other services need to go with this? We can provide jail services better if we provide all these other services mm -hmm. better. Um, so that's fantastic to yeah. know. Those relate, those are things that everyone in the county wants to know is happening in their county, and children's services. Those are the kind of things that, you're right, you don't see every day, but if they're not happening, you know, I like to tell people the reason you're just unfamiliar is because you're not interacting, but if we are not doing our jobs well, you're going to know it. And so that is the important piece of county government. The other thing is not only what we do, because we're mandated to do it and how we do it, but we, there are also things that are potential things that we could be doing as county government. I think of that way, that in, um, by way of partnerships with especially the um, local jurisdictions. We partner with the city in pretty substantial ways when you think of the banks and other things. But we also need to partner with the other 48 jurisdictions in the county. And so we are trying to have a more robust partnership through economic development dollars so that the outlying communities also benefit from a partnership with the county. Or it could be something as basic as buying salt or maintaining fire hydrants. I mean, we, do, we share a 911 system uh, with those outlying jurisdictions. And importantly, the county has this great coordinated system. It's, it's really very well run. And in, in partnership with the local jurisdictions, we are funding that system. And so 
county government does behave like a partner, I think we can do more. Uh, and we're trying to move into that space right now. Um, but that's also really important work. So your town may be working with the county in ways that you don't even know. That's right. So the emergency services um, yeah. are coordinating the alert 911. And so you get these emergency notifications, and they can do it um, area by area, neighborhood by neighborhood. And so if, it, if it's not, you know, if it's a hurricane, we're all impacted. But if it's a chemical spill in St. Bernard, and th then people in St. Bernard get notified of that if they're connected to the alert 911. So it is really an interesting uh, service that's provided by the county, and it can be life-saving. Uh, so I do encourage yeah. everybody to sign up for that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Now, there's some specific programs happening through the county level, um, and I want to talk about one of them in, in particular because you are really involved with this, and that is the Commission on Women's and Women and Girls. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. What is that? What's going on? So it started when I got here, um, and you know what the whole idea was to promote the voice and issues related to women and girls in Hamilton County. Um, I was only a, the second county commissioner ever, the, a woman that's been elected, and I'm now the president of the commission. I think I don't. I think I'm the first woman ever president. I don't know, but re regardless, um, I wanted to bring a special emphasis about women and girls to the community and to the work that we do. And so we formed this uh, commission. It's 20 women and 10 girls. We are in the second iteration this year. We, we did it last year. And it's just a really interesting group of volunteers that come together once a month. Uh, they split them, and, and they do the work. They, I didn't uh, tell them, hey, these are the issues you need to work on. They have defined the issues themselves and separated themselves into committees related to safety, related to leadership, related to raising the voice of women in the, in the community, related to kind of holistic supports, including housing in Hamilton County, uh, recognizing that, it's, let's take housing for instance, so many women are head of household in this community and are struggling to put a roof over the head of their families. Uh, and so, because some of them are single parent um, head of households. And so there are some issues that are really critical, particularly to women and kids in the community. And so we wanted to, as I said, kind of shine a light on those. And so the first iteration, we honed in on some of these issues and we, they made recommendations. One of the recommendations last year was that when someone applies for a job at the county, we no longer ask for pay history because women make 80 cents on the dollar to men. And if you are going by pay history, women will always make less than men. And so that's just patently unfair and, and not the way we need to go. And so we no longer ask that question when you're applying for a job at the county. So that's just an example. Um, one other example was that we diversify our boards and commissions, particularly by, by way of gender and race. And so uh, of the appointments we made in the first two years after that recommendation, 77% of those uh, recommendations or appointments have been either people of color or women. So we have tried to be true to the recommendations. So the, the next iteration um, is in place. Okay. And the recommendations are coming forward tonight uh, okay. for the second group. And they w it's such a great group. It's such a great group. The girls are so powerful in this group. It's, they're so smart. And so they have honed in on a need that they identified related to period products being available in school because girls miss school um, because they don't have access to period products or you know they're not feeling well or whatever it is. And so it's twofold. One is to remove the stigma uh, for girls when they're on their periods. But the other one is to provide some like um, some fairness and justice in their view from uh, for, to this issue to say if there is a girl that can't afford to buy period products they will be available in the school so that she can go to school and they have made it a very high priority they testified in front of the school board uh, with CPS which was awesome they were awesome and so what we are doing tonight is um, accepting that recommendation and recommending out that the school boards throughout the county take a look at a policy related to this. So that is what kind came out of kind of the, the girls. Um, the women were focused on other things. An example of that is that um, there is an effort in this community, and the city has already picked it up, to provide um, 
special services to victims of domestic violence. If a call comes in to an emergency system, uh, you know, 911 call, and the first responders go out on the scene, police, fire, we want to have a treatment specialist that's, um, you know, specializes in domestic violence work to be on scene so that the victim of domestic violence has access to resources right away in case she and maybe her kids are in danger if they were to go back home. And so what are the services available immediately? And then uh, what other kind of supports do they need? And so they are recommending that the county um, fund in partnership with the local jurisdictions. We have to get them on board um, in a very specific area uh, where they've identified hot spots. And so we have, I mean, I think the thought process is maybe we roll this out in the hot spots to pretty low cost in partnership with the local community, see how it goes. But um, they've done this in the city of Cincinnati and they have reduced the homicide rate dramatically for these women. So um, that's, I know that's one of the recommendations coming forward. So the report itself is called A Seat at the Table. And I think it's important to note that part of the emphasis of the group is just to have women sitting in the rooms where decisions are made. And so I've got a really quick example, and, and really uh, part of my um, frame for all of this, um, I served on the Cincinnati Recreation Commission for 16 years. I was a volunteer board member, and there was an issue that came in front of us related to ball fields. And uh, my daughter was playing softball at the time, and her team couldn't find a field to practice or play on. And the entire city of Cincinnati, and we lived in Price Hill, and I said, well, that's crazy. We've got over 100 fields. And so I went to recreation and said, what, what's going on with these fields? And they said they had permitted all of the fields to not hold baseball, which is for young boys, which is a great program. But they, they had all the fields, and they were using all the fields. And I said, well, why in the world do they need all the fields? And they said, well, in case one of them gets rained out, they go to another field. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, so do you know that there are girls that play softball that can't, find a field and, and they did not know and I said okay so we need to do something here so we peeled back some of, and not was like okay I mean they didn't realize and so we peeled back some of what they were getting and gave some fields to the girls uh, for softball and when I saw the list I'm like well now we don't want like the very bottom 10 fields in the I mean in the most remote locations in the city we want to play on decent fields just like the boys want to play on decent fields. And so we mixed that up a little bit. The girls got decent fields to play on, and, and the leagues went forward. But had I not been, as a woman with a daughter, been sitting at that table at that time, they would have gone without fields or access to fields. And I'm like, that's crazy. And so, but it does highlight the need to have a diversity of voices and experience sitting at every table. And so women are such an important part of every conversation. We need to be in the room, at the table, when the decisions are made. Tell me where you are finding these great young ladies to be the girls on this commission. They're applying. I mean, it, it's not hard to find them. Um, the first time we put out the application for the first group, we had 176 applications for 30 spots. So it was really hard to sort through. But the other thing that we intentionally did was make sure there was the appropriate diversity. And by diversity, I mean geography, race, age, um, social, economic status. Um, one of the interesting things, a uh, learning for me, I mean, I, I know that it's important to have a diversity of um, you know, geography. Yeah, we can't have, all the kids can't go to the same school, for instance. Yeah, that, that would be silly. Um, so we were very careful to have kids from private school, kids from charter schools, kids from public schools, from all over the, the county. But the one thing that really um, was the most critical piece of the diversity was the age of the individuals. Because the girls obviously are the young end of the spectrum, but they have had such a different experience than the woman on the commission that's 70 years old. And so to hear them communicate with each other about what had happened in the past and what's happening now, and it was just really interesting to watch, and it informed how the woman feels about what's going on now and how the girl understands what used to happen and how far we've come or not, right? So, right. Um, so anyway, the age diversity it, it was really important. And so the second time around, 
we again were very intentional about this diversity piece. Ten of the women from the first group rolled over to the second, so we had a lot of continuity. And so we had ten new women and ten new girls. And so, but the ten in the middle kind of brought us all together and said, okay, this is what we've been doing. This is what we've been working on. Let's build on that. Take new ideas at the same time, but kind of build it into a framework. Because interestingly, both times they wanted to focus on the same issues or the same kind of issues. And so it made it easy to just roll into the second year. Um, the recommendations this year, though, have a little bit of a finer point on them because we were a little better organized. We had already started to do some of the research and the work. And so there are more recommendations this time than there were last time. And that's, I think it's really interesting that when we see divide right now, we expect to see divides maybe between men and women or maybe between parties. But that's, it's, there's right now generationally, mm -hmm. we have sometimes generations that don't communicate well together. So to see them together and learning from each other on this commission is really fantastic to see. So much fun. One thing, um, when you, if you were to watch one of our meetings, we meet on Saturday mornings and we meet for about three hours. And so again, there's a girl intentionally in every subcommittee. Um, and so it's women and girls together. And so whenever one of the girls speaks in the, in the group, you can see the women go like this and lean in and and it's great because the girl feels important and empowered yeah. by that and the women are really trying to listen right and and absorb what's being said because so often we either don't have the opportunity to listen to young people or, or we don't think to listen to young people but the policies we're creating impact young people and so it has been so much fun to have these girls and this I'm telling you these girls are a powerhouse and uh, when they went to CPS and they've done some other interviews they're just awesome. So I'm, I'm really proud of them. So what are you hearing as feedback from the girls when they're done with the program now that you've had one season behind you? Um, I, I have heard that the girls um, have started to view themselves as leaders in our community, which is very cool and awesome. They also have taken some of the, one girl in the commission right now is going to organize her own community forum at a school and talk about how girls can get more active in the areas of leadership, whether it's you know public office or business or nonprofit or whatever it is, how to empower girls and start to have them think about what they can be in the future. She's doing it on her own. It, it is not part of the work we're doing as a commission, and yet um, she's, she's going full bore on this thing. And, and so I, I feel like um, they have thought a little bit differently about their role in this community conversation that we should always be having. And so that's been a lot of fun to watch. So I see the commission creating policies and programs, but also individually impacting the people mm -hmm. participating. That's mm -hmm. really impressive. Yeah, and, and, and it goes for the women too, to a lesser extent, because they're older and they have more confidence, um, but particularly with the girls. Um, it's just, and, and they, the other thing about the girls is that they communicate with one another and so they're boosting up one another. These kids don't know each other. They didn't know each other before they walked into the room. And they're from all over the place with really different backgrounds. And so it's been interesting to watch them learn from one another because they, they figure out where they, what they have in common. Uh, and then they also bring in their differences to, to kind of expand the thinking of the group as a whole. So it's just really been a neat experience. So what is the, the, the season? They're about to make their recommendations um, this evening. Yep. Um, when will you start for the next season of commission, looking to next year? So we will probably be accepting applications starting in December. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a breather after the recommendations. We're going to have a Christmas party. And then uh, we will accept, accept applications. That's usually a 30-day window. And so that will run through the end of December. And then probably in January, we'll uh, get an opportunity to sort through all the applications, appoint the new commissioners, and swear them in probably in January. Is there information online if someone is watching this and saying, I need to be involved in this, I want to apply? Yes, you can go to the county website, and the uh, Commission on Women and Girls, I think it has like its own tab. I'm not, okay. not the most... Um, 
the best and uh, all that stuff. But anyway, I'm told that if you go there, you will find the tab that says Commission on Women and Girls. There's a, an application. In fact, the Commission on Women and Girls recommended that we, we reconfigure the application because the application for county boards, and we have many, many boards, is a little intimidating. Um, it asks all these questions, and it's clearly geared towards an adult. And so when you've got girls applying, it's intimidating. And so we have reconfigured the application for the girls, which is very cool. And so um, it, it asks more relevant questions. It doesn't ask about employment history. It asks, what school do you go to? You know, so um, mm -hmm. we've really tried hard to be as welcoming and as open as we can be. Um, for, and, and their feedback back to us has been so important to help us say, oh, yeah, we need to change that. And so we did. And so the application's online, um, so folks can go there once that window opens. Probably it'll be in December sometime, um, and then go ahead and apply. Okay. Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I that's hope right. everyone goes to the website and goes to look for more information about this. I hope this. so, too. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to finding out more about the impact of the recommendations going mm -hmm. forward. Um, I know you've already changed uh, based on their pay history recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I love how quickly the recommendations are acted on mm -hmm. because it's, there's probably, there are a lot of things out there where they say we're going to get together, we're going to talk around a table, we're going to make, a, come up with ideas and then it ends there. Right. Um, for them to be part of this process but then also see those things be acted on, making it better for women of girls and girls in the whole community. Yeah. That's really impressive. Well, we're going to have recommendations um, tonight, and we will also have resolutions in front of us tonight. So um, last time, we adopted a few of the recommendations, but we kind of did it on the fly. You know, it was like, well, let's, let's do that. Let's have a formal motion. And, and so we did it, but it was less organized. This, having learned from that experience, I said, well, to each of the subcommittees, you tell me what your recommendation, what, what that flushes out to by way of action for the county or for a school board or whatever else. And so we're, I think we've got like six or seven resolutions that will be in front of us tonight, um, either to do things differently internally, so we can, our, our training for, for um, providing reasonable accommodations for victims of domestic violence. That's another one. That's an internal policy that we can act on right away. So some of them are like that. Other ones are saying we are going to advocate to public school boards to adopt period product policies. So some of it's inward facing and some of it's outward facing. There's another one that talks about a pay equity pledge. And so we did a pay equity study at the county. We're actually doing pretty well. Okay, I know, know, right? That's it was great. Like, oh, okay. It, yeah, it really was great. We're really, really close to even. It was okay. really, uh, really impressive. But what we want to do is encourage other entities, whether they're business or nonprofit or whatever they are, to also think through pay equity as it relates to their you know, company or their organization. And so we are trying to get businesses to sign on to a pay equity pledge that says it's not mandated and it's not forced on anybody. But what it says is we, too, are going to try to make sure that we are providing equitable uh, pay for women and men in our, in our space. And so that is going to launch as one of these recommendations. So they're, they're internal, they're external by way of other organizations, and they're also kind of community-wide recommendations. So it's kind of fun that they're all of the above uh, because that gives us some opportunity in the next group to kind of move forward with some of the other stuff. And these are happening. I'm just going to mention this. You're talking about they're making the recommendations tonight. Um, because this will they'll run at different times, folks might not realize, this is at the regular Hamilton County Commissioner's meeting. Mm -hmm. um, viewers can watch those meetings. Yeah. Every time you have one, they are filmed, they are streamed live. Uh, we stream them on Waycross. Mm -hmm. um, and you are now meeting once a month, roughly out in a community in the evening, yeah. too, so yeah. that if folks say, but I can't watch them at 1 in the afternoon right. on a Thursday, well, at least once a month, you'll, you're, you're somewhere in the evening. Yeah, so when I became president, it occurred to me that we need to be more accessible to the community. And so uh, once a month, we go out into the community um, in the evening so that regular citizens can either watch or come and participate. And what we have found is there are most crowded meetings. 
Uh, people from the communities do come out. They're either curious or they want to weigh in on something or, you know, and all, all are welcome. So we're out in Woodlawn tonight. Uh, and they're very, I'm really excited to go out to Woodlawn. They're excited to have us, which is nice. Um, and that, that has been the case. We've been in Silverton and Green Township, and we, we've been all over the place, Cheviot. So um, we go out. We do the evening meeting. It's at 6.30 once a month. It's the, I guess it's the third meeting of the month. Um, but anyway, it's been good fun to go out. And, and of course, we're going to give Woodlawn the opportunity to talk about Woodlawn. And, and, and that's a learning for us. As county commissioners, we really do need to know what's going on out in these um, communities. And so it's a great opportunity for them to kind of um, proudfully say what's going on and for us to say, now I become an advocate for what you're doing because you just told me what you're doing. You know, so Oh, I do. Yeah, we're like a trumpet, you know. We had the opportunity to have you in Coleraine and in Forest yeah. Park and as people in those areas knowing that this is Hamilton County government, but we also know that you're down here on East Court Street. Mm -hmm. um, so it's wonderful for us to know you're also out in all of the other, in the townships and all the other towns and cities and villages that we have in the community. And so. we are trying to spread it around. Um, yeah. So trying to, and so that started this year, so that was 12. And so we'll do another 12 next year. And so there are 48. Uh, so we'll eventually get there, I hope. Um, but the other thing that uh, it was new this year is that once a year, there's a state of the county presentation. Mm -hmm. And generally, that was done at the Rotary Club. And I have a lot of respect for the Rotary Club. But it is a lunch, and it's invite only. And so we wanted to do it a little differently this year. And so we had um, the state of the county at Memorial Hall in the evening again so people could attend open to the public it was free and um invited people in to participate with us to kind of be part of the dialogue and um and it was really fun and a really different look for hamilton county so i was really excited about that too so the state of the county these evening meetings are all part of this effort to make us just more accessible and and help people understand, like you said at the very beginning, help them understand what in the world the county does. Yeah, I want people to know what the county does. And that really is the easiest way to find out. Just watch the meetings, whether you can go in person, yep. or whether you watch online, or whether you watch on community access television. Um, you can hear exactly what kind of issues come before you on a regular basis mm -hmm. and see this is what's happening. Yeah. Um, and of course, anyone at tonight's Woodlawn meeting will get to hear the recommendations mm -hmm. of the Commission on Women and Girls. Right. So they'll be, the, they'll be the directly to them. All, and <laughs> everything else going on. And you yeah. can come and go because it does get a little mundane after a while, you know, um, right. when we run through the consent agenda items because it's, it's kind of like the business of the day kind of stuff. Um, so I, I just want to tell people they can come for part or all. Uh, does, we, we are not offended when people say, that's what I was here for, that's what I'm interested in, and I don't really care about this next zoning change, and, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, they're, they're interesting, and, and you know, the engineer, for instance, gives a report at these meetings. Every community is impacted by the work the engineer does, because it's the infrastructure, it's the roads, it's the bridges, it's the maintenance. Every community cares about that, uh, because we've got roads in need of repair everywhere. And so the engineer has the opportunity to say, this is coming to your community, this is the time frame, this is this will be the detour. And so it can be really informative, like an everyday kind of informative. Yeah, actually, when we talk about most of county government, and most of it falls into that category that you said earlier, um, if you haven't experienced it, it's because you haven't had these things happen to you, you haven't been in jail, you haven't needed the, the child services. But there is one aspect of county government that affects all of us every day, and it's right. the roads. Most of us think of the roads as something that belongs to our town, but the main ones that are mm -hmm. connecting, our main roads that we're driving through the county to work on every day, those are county roads. Yeah. And no, so, so they're state, they're right. county, they're local. I mean, yeah. you know, we all share in that responsibility. I mean, you know, when people say, well, you know, what does government do generally? What does government, you know, there, and government has a really important role to play. Because if we don't do what we do well, you can't do what you do well. It, whether you're a resident, uh, uh, you know, going to school, operating a business, going to work, you need government to provide this collective, you know, road infrastructure or sidewalk infrastructure or a 911 response when there's an emergency. That's what government does. And so you don't always associate that with government, but that's our role. And so hopefully, 
if you don't know what we do, then everything's going okay, right? If it doesn't exactly. go, like we had a situation out on the west side where um, a road and a bridge washed out because of the flooding. Um, you bet we heard a lot about that because things weren't going well on the west side and it took a while to stabilize the land, literally stabilize it so we could rebuild. Um, we heard a lot about that, that's county government. Um, so we, and the input by the way is important. So, um, you know, we are, I feel like we're pretty accessible by way of our website, all our mm -hmm. contact information's on there. And so we get calls about all kinds of different stuff. Um, so, it, and, and it's also some of the big stuff. I mean, the music venue is, we're doing that in partnership with um, the private promoter, MEMI, M-E-M-I, the city, um, the Joint Bank Steering Committee. So that's a huge project that the county is participating in to bring economic development to the center city on the banks, right? Um, so that's an example of like a really big yeah. thing. Uh, the Millennium Hotel, the Headquarter Hotel is another Just one. Just going to mention that. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's new. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's a big deal. We did we did public hearings on that when I first got here to say to the community, or rather ask the community, what are your top priorities when it comes to some of these really big things like expanding the convention center, the arena, the Headquarter Hotel. The Headquarter Hotel rose to the top for many, many reasons, but primarily because it doesn't make any sense to expand the convention center if you don't have a headquarter hotel that's functioning as it should. And so we took that seriously. Those are hotel motel tax dollars. They're not general fund dollars, but we need to strategically invest those. And so we have been trying desperately to get control of uh, that property because it's, in, it's not in very good shape um, so that we can provide for a really good headquarter hotel. So we're in the process, as you know, uh, in trying to get all those pieces worked out. Um, but that's another thing that the county, because we have all these different funds, um, restricted funds that, so, so that one is, uh, comes in from hotel nights. So they're not local resident dollars. These are travelers dollars that oh, come in uh, when people stay at hotels. Okay. And so we take those dollars and we say, those have to be spent related to convention business, to touristy kinds of things. And so what better to spend that on than a headquarter hotel? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we did. But we've got like parking revenue funds, we've got the stadium fund, we're all familiar with that one. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the general fund, which is pays for the courts, the jail, and the, the, the mandated services. So we are doing our best. We're pretty lean and mean here at the county, um, but we are trying to do our best with those dollars to capitalize on opportunities that exist. That's exciting because these things, banks and convention center, they affect our whole county. I think sometimes yeah. it's easy to think of those as downtown things, but bringing dollars in, bringing tourists in, getting people from outside the area to see Cincinnati as a great destination. There is so much in this entire county for those people to get involved in mm -hmm. if we get them here. Well, the other thing, let's talk about the hotel motel tax for just a minute. So, yes, we are investing that in a headquarter hotel, but the other piece of that is the Sharonville Convention Center. And so, kind of the gem to the north. And so, they are part of this continuum of space where if you are too small to afford or, or need right. um, Duke Energy Center, you go to the Sharonville Convention Center. Mm -hmm. And they're doing gangbuster business up there and are looking to expand. It's only because we are doing so well with the hotels downtown and to the north that we are capable of saying to them, we will partner with you and provide some of the dollars from that fund to help you expand to grow business and grow the economy. And so the downtown drives that activity yeah. up to the north and the north helps support what they're doing too. So it's this great partnership and that's a, a really clear example of how the symbiotic relationship between the downtown city, the economic core, the driver, mm -hmm. but then all these other jurisdictions that are part of the equation and that are part of the growth of the county. That is a really clear visual example yeah. of seeing how those work together, yeah. which is fantastic. Are there any specific, and there's there's a whole, there's I have a whole list of things, of course, there's a lot going on in the county right mm -hmm. now. Um, rather than keep you forever, is there anything in, in particular that you wanna make sure we get to talk about before we finish today? Um, we're, well, we're doing, we're really doing a lot of stuff. Um, one other thing that is fairly unique to, to myself, really, 
Uh, I'm the head of the Heroin Coalition, mm -hmm. and um, this is a group of really smart people who are in the space of prevention, treatment, uh, law enforcement, public health, hospitals, faith community, business community, all sitting at the same table at the same time talking about the how we save lives, get people into treatment, and long-term recovery. And so we just had a meeting yesterday, and that's why it's so top of mind. We are doing our best to connect the dots between the silos so that we're all talking to one another. We've got some really interesting uh, initiatives in the county where, let me give you one example, it's the quick response team that some people are familiar with. If you um, have an overdose victim, uh, you provide the Narcan, so you save the life. Okay. Um, then that person can either go to the hospital, the ED, or not. They don't have to. So if you go to the hospital, we've got the hospitals at the table, and we're trying to provide the warm handoff to treatment. But if they don't go, how are we touching them? How are we getting them? And so we've got quick response teams that go out every week to the east and to the west to knock on the door of those individuals and try to get them into treatment. Um, sometimes we succeed on the first try, sometimes we don't. Um, addiction is difficult. Um, and the people that uh, need the help, it, you know, it, it's, they're, sometimes they're in crisis. I mean, they just overdose, so they're in, they're in crisis. Um, and so we're doing our best work there, um, but connecting those people to treatment. But then you have to, well, where do they go? What, where's the treatment bed, right? Or where's the outpatient service that's necessary to help that person? So we've established an engagement center in the city where those people go for an assessment and then they assess what is the most appropriate treatment for that individual. They keep them there, help them detox, about seven days stay, and then the whole warm hand. So um, all of this work was done together, collaboratively. And now we're starting to say to ourselves, all right, save a life, got them into treatment, long-term recovery. What does that look like? What kind of supports do we need by way of employment or transportation or housing to make sure those individuals who we've invested in and who are in recovery stay in recovery. Let me help that business owner that's willing to take the chance on that individual um, and provide some support there. And so we've got businesses in this community doing that right now, Nehemiah uh, Industries is one, where um, we're making some real strides. And so it's difficult work, it, it, it takes a long time to see success and we're still losing hundreds of people we're going to be over 400 people in this year that we've lost to overdoses. 400 people in Hamilton County. That's terrible. It's a crisis. But we're working really hard to do our best work to try to save those folks and, and then save the family and then save the community. And so um, I just want to say that it's important work. And if people yeah. do need help uh, or know individuals that need help, um, there are hotlines, the Addiction Services has a hotline, I don't, can't remember the number off the top of my head, or contact my office. Uh, okay. And we okay. will put you in touch with um, a hotline where you can get immediate services. And I'm seeing a continuous theme of, we have services, how do we connect the people to them? Whether mm -hmm. it's, and it's interesting to me, because these are, this, is, this theme is coming from completely different areas. The Commission on Women and Girls talked about connecting women to the domestic violence services. Mm -hmm. um, Trina Jackson and talked about connecting uh, people leaving jail to the kind of services they need to not go back to jail. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing, connecting people who have addictions to the services, not just sending them home and said, it's just, you know, here's a flyer. It's more humane and dignified yeah. for people. It's also smarter. You know, we're making investments here and they're long-term investments. So everything you just talked about is a strategic investment in people and in their long-term su success. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do by way of partnership in the county. Uh, and so many of our services are like that when you think of what we do. Um, and then we start to think a little bit differently about economic development, but that is kind of the next frontier. Mm -hmm. we, with this um, sales tax issue, we're just trying to solidify the base, do what we do well, and then move out a little bit and say, what more could we be doing to partner with the community? So we're kind of trying to hit on all cylinders right now. Well, it's interesting because there are those, we started at the beginning with the basic things yeah. that county government does. Um, and it could be, it could be stay at that basic level. Yeah. But if we're not connecting to anyone to those services, um, then, it, then they're yeah, not, they're not right. cost effective if, not, if we're not getting the right people to them. That's right.
Um, so I think, and, and you've touched on more things. We've talked about um, looking at sales tax. We've talked about, there's um, FC Cincinnati things yeah, to yeah, talk yeah, about. Yeah. We're um, building a garage for FC. But here's the thing about FC. Uh, we're almost finished with this. Um, the, I mean, the, the agreement with FC. But here's the thing. So we said we would build a thousand spots to the benefit of F FC for game days. But we also said there has to be a community benefit. And so we are going to make sure that that garage that we build, or it's going to be two garages, have a community benefit for the development going on in those communities outside of just providing spots for FC. Mm -hmm. So again, a very strategic approach yeah. to saying the thousand spots will be here, but we're going to do it here and here because there's development going on here and residential and commercial and they need parking spots. So it'll benefit everybody. Uh, and that's the kind of approach we're trying to bring to just kind of county government. That's great. I want to thank you for taking time. Yeah, sure. It's I really pleasure. appreciate the time that, that you allowed me to take out of your day to sure. do this. Um, I want to let folks know that if you have any questions, you have been. You mentioned it earlier. You're very accessible. Yep. All the commissioners. Of course, on the website. We're all on there. All the information. You yep. can email. You can phone call. Yep. Um, so I really want to encourage folks to take advantage of that, that this is very accessible local government where your voice is something that they're listening to. Yep. And um, welcome. Thank you. Which I really appreciate. Yes, of course. So I want to thank you also for watching County Fair on Waycross Community Media and make sure you tune in every month to find out what's going on in your county.